said, you guys should know about me, is I've been coming here since I was like this big. My mom brought me. But uh, uh, for the longest time, uh, there have been these blue books in the, in the pews, and they're the hymnals. And we're going to go ahead and sing from those again. Uh, but this is a tradition of the, the, the older music as it was. But uh, we love that stuff here. And we're going to go ahead and get into it. So uh, I think it's number 54. Uh, the words are also going to be up here on the screen. Uh, it's Great is Thy Faithfulness. Yeah. Can somebody confirm that it is 54 for me? It is 54. Woo! So if you want to use the blue books in here.
your top. Hold it, top. Hey, morning. I'm okay. All over the places. That's what I'm going to do. What an amazing, faithful God we have. And just Amen. Thank you to you for all the work they put in. And I'm excited. Uh, a couple of things as we get started. Uh, a, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. B, it's nice to see you. Uh, C, announcements. <laughs> A um, couple things this morning. Uh, we're going to fix the roof on the garage on the 13th of October. So um, if you're under 70 years old, <laughs> put that on your calendar. We have a wedding to go to. Now, if you're over 70 years old, bring a lawn chair and get ready to heckle. How about that? <laughs> Any community project still needs the community, right? So uh, all you folks, if you're, uh, if you're of a mature, if you're vintage, you know, if you're a classic, you can still come on out. You can still cheer on us young guys, right? Because I'm not eligible for the senior saints yet. Uh, but just, we'd love to have everybody come out and help us with that. And so this is, this is a project that, at, when we looked at our budget at the beginning of the year, we thought, okay, we could have some trouble this year. So we were very careful with our finances through the half of the year, and we're doing okay. By the grace of God, by your generosity, the budget is intact, and we're doing okay. Amen. And, and so I'm so thankful for who you are and how generous and faithful you are. Uh, and so we looked at a couple projects, and we said, we can do the roof project if we can source the labor internally. So I'm hoping that we can put together a good team, a solid team, and uh, maybe you know twist some arms from those college students who hang around from time to time. There's two of them there catching folks. Beat them, beat them. Get them. Yeah. Beat them. Do whatever it takes, because uh, we could use a little bit of help like that. Uh, so uh, we've decided to use money that we already have because you've been so generous to do that. Now, we also have another project that we'd like to do. And I've been, I've tried to be very careful about uh, twisting arms for donations to special projects uh, from you as your pastor. I never want to be the pastor who just walks in every week and says, we need more money. I, I don't want to be that guy. Okay? But there's an important project that we're working on. It's our fellowship hall in the basement. And the reason that this is an important project is the way that we use that room. We serve families in our community. When someone has died, we, we use that room to serve those families a, a meal, a time where they can fellowship and get together. And so that room is an important space. And it's been, it's been a while since it's been renovated. And we started by thinking about the chairs. Now, I left a couple of examples of our current chairs out there, and I, I bought a single cheap chair just for comparison. So there's a chair portion of the project that would run maybe three to five thousand dollars somewhere in there, and then we went as we thought about it. It's like, are we going to take nice chairs and put them on this carpet that desperately needs to be replaced? And are are we trusting the Lord for the things that we see? Are we trusting the Lord by faith to use this room in, in service to the community? Are we going to trust the Lord for something a little bit bigger? And folks, I intentionally don't know who has or doesn't have money. I believe that you're all rich, right? <laughs> uh, and so when I think about how, um, how to ask you for money, my prayer is that God blesses you so much that you're like, what am I going to do with all this money? I guess I'll give a little bit to the church. I ask God to bless you and put it in your pockets. And then I trust you with it because you've been so great and so generous. So we're starting to look at downstairs. We're getting some quotes. I don't have an exact number on the carpet yet. It will be uh, a couple thousand dollars. So I want you just to be praying about it. Lord, uh, how can we use this space to serve members of the community, to serve people at important times in their life, weddings and funerals, those kinds of things. And then also, as a church family, we can enjoy that space. So I want you just to pray about it. And, uh, and as the Lord leads you, as the Lord blesses you, we actually have a couple ways you can give. Uh, we have online giving, uh, so if you have a smartphone, you can just open up your smartphone 
And it's, the app is called Tithely, T-I-T-H-E-L-Y. And it's very easy to use. You just plug in and you just, building fund, and you just push the button and it's there. Okay, very easy. We still take checks and cash. Okay, so if, if the Lord leads you, thank you. I'll thank you in advance for helping out with this important project. Another thing that you can do, and I've, I've done this, I have a, a, some friends who are good friends of mine, and they're the kind of friends who are interested in helping me and us do our ministry. And so I plan to just write a, a very tasteful email and say, you have been willing to help us in the past, here's a project that, that you can support. So you might have friends that you can just say, hey, uh, no, it's not a pressure kind of a deal, we don't want to twist any arms, but we just want to say, if you're led by the Lord, we can use the help. I actually had my atheist friend uh, give us $50. So. <laughs> can is. the Lord do it? Absolutely. And, and we don't want to have, we want to have teeny tiny faith, we want to have robust faith. We want to That's trust right. into those kind of things. That's so. right. I hope nobody feels like I'm twisting our arms or, or, or anything like that. I am so thankful for who you are as a body and, and for how generous you already are. Uh, there's also a card. Uh, you know, Mary Lou Phelps, her husband died recently. Her birthday's coming up. So there's a card going around, and Rachel has that, so please see her. Um, there are missing dishes downstairs, so if you need some dishes, um, <laughs> maybe yours are in the kitchen. And then save the date, December 9th, for some Christmas care. Did that forget anything? Let's pray together. The what? Oh, that's right. Thank you. And for the basement project, there is already uh, $3,500 in matching funds available. So every dollar that you give towards that project is matched. So it's like $2. So you help. Yay! Yeah. Our donations from the ages is $100. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Woo -hoo -hoo. Hey. Can the Lord do it? Yes, He can. Yes, so. He can. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for your incredible faithfulness to us. I pray, Lord, that as we look into your word, you just look into our hearts, Father. I pray, Father, you just, uh, just encourage us today with what you've written in Scripture. In Christ's name, amen. amen. As you know, we've been sort of walking through the book of Acts. We've, we've just kind of begun. Uh, we've started walking through the book of Acts. And when you... Oh, that's the wrong one. Sorry. When you um, this isn't the technology. This is me. When you develop a sermon, there are a number of different ways that you can do it. You can start with a, a stylistic introduction, and you know, a funny story about your grandkids, or you know, a not so funny story about submarines that only half of your audience gets. I mean, that has happened in the past. <laughs> uh, you can start with you know any number of different places, but you try to start with something that brings people to the point, and then you spend the rest of the sermon explaining the point. But there are other ways that you can do it. And so today I'm going to do things a little bit differently than starting with the point and explaining the point. I'm going to explain the point, make the point, and then do some more explaining. So if you feel a little bit lost, a little bit loster than usual, that's okay, because we're going to get to an important point. I'd like to start just by reading this passage of Scripture, because one of the things that I'm trained to do is to look at Scripture and go, why is that there? To ask questions. And you know, I've got, uh, can I see your book? I ordered a number of these little books, which basically is Acts, the text of the book of Acts on one side, and a blank page on the other. There are still some available at the Welcome Center. I do need $4 a piece, so here I am hitting you up for money again. <laughs> um, but one of the ways you can use this is just by asking questions. And so, as I read through this section in Acts, I thought, why is this here? Because we all know what happens in Acts chapter 2, right? The Holy Spirit comes down and empowers the church. It's a big event. And so why is Acts chapter 1, verses 12 through 26, in the Bible? Well, let's think about that. Last week we talked about Acts 1 through 11, where the disciples are given a mission from the Lord before he ascends into heaven. The main ideas were this, that the early church was fully identified with Jesus 
as they waited for the empowering Holy Spirit. This is a time of great anticipation. The Holy Spirit is coming. The Holy Spirit is going to empower you for ministry. The disciples anticipate the restoration of Israel, a king and a kingdom that will get rid of the Roman Empire and usher in an age of peace and prosperity. And these people, they were counting on Jesus as the king to come in and do this, and they were his closest followers. Now, wouldn't it be great to be close to a king? Hey, king, what are we doing this weekend? <laughs> oh, we're going to go to, you know, fly around the world, do fun stuff. Who's buying for that? Oh, you are? Oh, great. Who wouldn't want to be the friend of a king? So the Jewish religious leaders, uh, they, so just feel the anticipation of waiting for the king to come back. The Jewish religious leaders used the Roman Empire to try and kill the Son of God. He comes back from the dead, and you've seen him alive with your own eyes, along with all of your close friends. He ascends to heaven and promises to send you power to do the mission. Well, let's do it, right? I mean, this is exciting to think about, to just empowered from the oh, yeah. Acts 1 12. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, with his brothers. You feel like they're just waiting, and the anticipation is just building. They're praying together. They're in unity. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers, a number about 120, and said, Brothers and sisters, the scripture had to be fulfilled in which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through David concerning Judas, who served as a guide for those who arrested Jesus. He was one of our number and shared in our ministry. With the payment he received for his wickedness, Judas bought a field. There he fell headlong, his body burst open, and all his intestines spilled out. Yum. Gross. <laughs> Everyone in Jerusalem heard about this, so they called that field in their language, Akodama, that is, field of blood. For, said Peter, it is written in the book of Psalms, may his place be deserted, let there be no one to dwell in it, and may another take his place of leadership. Therefore, it is necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus was living among us, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So they nominated two men. Joseph called Barsabbas, also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen to take over the, his, uh, this apostolic ministry, which Judas left to go where he belongs. Then they cast lots, and the lot fell to Matthias, so he was added to the eleven apostles. Why is this <coughs> in the Bible? Because I, I look at this, and we just had a great business meeting yesterday. Right? We sat down, we talked about some uh, how to do some financial things, we talked about some projects. None of it was like Bible level excitement, right? Except maybe the Hebrews dummies. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I look at this and I think about like nobody has ever been this happy in a business meeting. <laughs> no. Okay, I'm getting a wave from my sound technician who's a business guy, and he's like, I am, yeah. If you're going to wave at me, you're going to get out. <laughs> Nobody's, okay, very few people are ever that happy in business. <laughs> Unless they just made like a million dollars on something. Business is business. And why is this business meeting in the Bible? At a time when we're waiting for the Holy Spirit to come down and empower the church to do their mission, Let's have a business meeting. Are these people Baptists? <laughs> yeah, but things still have to be done. That's true. You must have bagels and cream cheese. Or <laughs> <laughs> Why did they have this business meeting? Okay. Well, there are parts of the Bible that are hard to understand. There are other parts that seem very easy, and there are other parts that make you wonder. I wonder why is this business meeting here in the Bible? 
This is here, just a few days before the arrival of the Holy Spirit. And I think this whole section can be summarized by a single sentence. So let me rewrite the Bible for you just really quick. I think the Lord's going to be okay with it, because I'm not going to suggest that we add it. But let's summarize this. While the eleven apostles are waiting for the Holy Spirit, they realized they should replace Judas, who killed himself after betraying Jesus. So they added Matthias to the eleven and came up with twelve apostles. And now, on to the good stuff. Right? I'll submit this to the Lord and say, well, maybe we can change this. When you come out with 2.0, right? There's a reason. There has to be a reason why the Almighty God inspired the, the writer Luke to, he said, put that in there. Put that in there. That's important. So, the business meeting is important because it's in there. So let's think about why. Well, the reason is that the business meeting establishes continuity for the authoritative apostolic witness to the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. Let me think, let's think about that, because that's an important idea. The idea of continuity. That these disciples, okay, we're going to focus in on verses 12 through 14, that these disciples, who are also called apostles, are continuous with the ones who started Jesus' ministry. So the guys who were there at the beginning of the ministry are also there when Jesus has ascended to heaven at the beginning of their ministry. Continuity is very important. Luke chapter 6, verses 13 through 16, names the 12 disciples whose names are repeated in Acts 1.13, with the exception of, that's right, Judas. So the 12 guys, or the 11 guys who were with Jesus at the beginning, they saw everything that he said and did. Right? Now, there were probably times where one or two of them were, were off doing whatever chores they had to do, but as a group, you had 11 guys that you could ask and say, what happened when Jesus did or said this? And somebody would remember it. These same guys were present at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, and there was no turnover, there was no defection until Judas. Well, a disciple is a learner, a student of another who is his or her teacher. In the first century, people would live and work with a teacher in order to learn their way of life. This instruction wasn't just academic. It wasn't just showing up in class. It was showing up and listening to the, to the teacher teach, but then also having dinner with him, and then staying in the same hotel that he stayed at. Often in the first century, it would be the same room. Let me give you an example. When I was in seminary, uh, I had one professor his name is Dr. David L. Turner. I call him Doc. I took uh, five classes from Dr. Turner. So uh, after I took five classes from him, I served through two classes as his teaching assistant. In one class, now this is in seminary, so it was me and Dr. Turner. That was the whole class. And so we would have you know, class time, and we would sit down, and he would say, so... Tell me what you're learning about Ephesians. That was the lecture. He basically turned it over to me and said, tell me something. So I spent time with Dr. Turner. I also served as his teaching assistant. I did some uh, academic research stuff for him. So I know David Turner. When I read the books that he's written, I read them in his voice. Yeah. Hesitations and coughs and everything. I know David Turner. I could probably say that he's a friend of mine. When we're in Grand Rapids, he expects me to get a hold of him. I spent time with him. I know who he is. How much more the disciples who follow Jesus? If I know David Turner, these guys knew Jesus intimately. They knew what he said. They knew what he taught. And so when conflict comes up, and it will, these guys are the authoritative witnesses to his life and ministry. So these guys are disciples, they're followers of Jesus, they've been there, they've spent time with him, they know him. An apostle is a messenger, one who acts as an envoy of another person. They carry that person's message, but they also act on his behalf. When communication took months of travel, you couldn't just call the home office. So an apostle was an envoy sent with your message and with your authority to make decisions. 
So when Jesus called these guys both disciples, they were learners, they were followers, they knew his message. And then he's the one who sent them out. And what's the mission of the church according to Acts? To bear witness. To be an authoritative witness of what Jesus did and said. In in Acts, they're called apostles. They're still followers of Jesus, but they've been given a mission. They're in Jerusalem waiting for the Holy Spirit. They come together, they're praying together, and this demonstrates their obedience and their unity. These people are the ones, they're the witnesses that Jesus chose. There's a, a sense of continuity. The people who were there at the beginning, they were there at the end, and they're going to be there through the birth of the church. This demonstrates continuity. And the word continuity means this, the unbroken and consistent experience or operation of something over a period of time. You see, when the early church started, it didn't start in some backwoods, like they didn't say, let's go hide out in Montana and start some new religion. They didn't do that. They went to the center of the Jewish faith and they started Christianity there. So there had to be a continuous witness to who Jesus was and what he said. And can you imagine that there would be a little bit of opposition to new ideas about God? And about our relationship with God. And so these guys form, and, and how, would, how would you undermine a message if you wanted to undermine a message? Well, there's a couple of different ways. You can deny it outright. Well, that never happened. You say that Jesus healed a blind man, but that never happened. But if you have an authoritative set of witnesses, it's almost like you pull up the video evidence and you say, I know the guys who were standing there when he did it. Oh. Well, then, uh, Jesus never actually died on the cross. No, no, wait a minute. We saw him raised from the dead. So these guys are the authoritative witness. When someone tries to say it didn't happen, they're the ones who can say, no, 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 we were there, and this is what happened. And each of these guys went on to become rich and famous, right? No. No. They were tortured and killed specifically because they believed in Jesus. And their profession of who he was and what he did never changed. You know why? Because they were there, they saw it, they believed it, and they professed it. When I think about authoritative witness, I think about family stories. My my dad is a, I think everybody's dad is a large figure in their lives, right? And my dad is just gigantic. And he's tough. He was. My dad is like, and here's where I'm going to get in trouble, okay? Chuck Norris and John Wayne, if you smash those two guys together, that was my dad. And the stories that sort of come out of, okay, did I lose the millennials again? (laughs) Chuck Norris, John Wayne, are we okay? Okay, good. I'm trying to make sure, who's the toughest guy for the millennials? Still Chuck Norris? Still Chuck Norris, right? Only because you haven't met my dad. My dad used to be a truck driver. He would go on these long runs, and he came home one time, and this is the era before, you know, cellular telephones and all that kind of stuff. He came home one time, and there were two men sitting in his car. Yeah, what would you do? Well, we, I have a cell phone. I'd be like, there's a guy sitting in my car. <clears throat> my dad got in the back seat, didn't say a word, and just waited. And eventually these guys in the front seat, one of them kind of looked at the other one, and they got out and went on about their day, and dad got into the front seat and drove home. <laughs> that was my dad. When my dad was in Korea, He was across the valley from the Chinese, and so every morning he would taunt the Chinese people on the other side because it was the demilitarized zone. They weren't actively at war. And so every morning he would taunt them in a very specific and offensive way. (laughs) And so while he was doing that, one day he heard the mortar go off from the other side. And so he dove back into his tent, and the exact spot where he was standing, the mortar shell went off. Shrapnel just ruined his tent. 
And you know what my dad did? He went up here and He dusted himself off, <laughs> went and stood in the exact same spot, and did the exact same thing. <laughs> Now these are the stories about my dad and my brother and I, when we get together, what we love to do is we love to compare stories. Because my dad was also the guy who never took us out to eat. And so I'll say to my brother, do you ever remember, there's one time I remember my dad taking me out for ice cream. I remember him taking me fishing also one time. <laughs> and then I was done. Forever. So don't invite me. <laughs> the whole time. And so we'll sit around and we'll talk, and I'll, I'll talk to my brother and say, "Do you remember this about Dad?" And he says, "No, no, 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 no." So he's correcting. Uh, I'll remember something maybe a little bit wrong, and so he'll say, "Oh, no, 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 it was like this." I'll say, "Oh, yeah, now I remember." And if my mom is there, she'll chime in, and so we'll have all these different pictures of who my dad was. So we're correcting the authoritative uh, stories about who my dad was. Now they're on video. Maybe they'll last for a while. <laughs> I love to compare those stories. In the modern world, you know, we, we don't have these exact trained memories like they did in the first century. In the first century, they were very careful with information because you couldn't just write it down. And so these 11 men were the authoritative witness. And they compared their stories and made sure that when someone said Jesus didn't do this or Jesus didn't do that, they would be able to say, oh, no, no, no. We were there. We saw it happen. And we were, Jesus chose us at the beginning, and he chose us at the end to be authoritative witnesses of what actually happened. They're the, uh, the video evidence, as it were. When we think about applying this, in the 18th century, uh, deists believed in the existence of God, but they were skeptical about the miracles recorded in Scripture. And so some of them went through, they, they got several Bibles, and they would cut out all the miracles because they couldn't believe them. Those things didn't happen. So they would just make clippings, and they would paste together, this is the life and teaching of Jesus of Nazareth. Clip, clip, clip. You know what they ignored? The authoritative witness of the apostles. They tried to recreate Jesus to fit in some preconceived mold. And they were wrong to do that. Because the Bible has been reliably recorded of what Jesus did and said because it was written during the living memory of these people who saw it happen. And that's a very important thing. Modern people do the same thing. We want to make Jesus' life and teachings fit their notions of Christianity. I'm not talking about us. I'm talking about people. Oh yeah, Jesus was a nice man. When you're healing blind people and claiming to be God, maybe there's something there. Maybe there's something that you need to unpack just a little bit. Modern people do the same thing because it's easier to make up a Jesus that has no requirements of us. It's easier to uh, have a warm, fuzzy Jesus than to look and see what the page of Scripture requires of me. What does God want me to be and do? Well, I'll tell you, it's better than I am. We need to understand the authoritative witness of, that Luke wrote in Scripture. What Luke wrote happened. It happened in the real world, and we can rely on it. We need to read and understand Scripture in its historical and literary context. And when someone comes up with some alternative Jesus, we turn back and we say, no, these guys were there. It's not some new bunch of apostles. Hey, we're going to start a new religion out in Montana. I need some witnesses. And we'll all get our story straight. That's not what happened. They were in downtown Jerusalem where people saw what happened. So this business meeting established continuity for the authoritative apostolic witness to the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. These are the guys who were there. If you don't believe it, go ask them in the first century. They're all dead now. So the business meeting establishes continuity. It also establishes continuity with the historic faith of the Jewish people. This is Acts 15, uh, 1, 15 through 26. And I'll just summarize because I've already read it. Peter says, uh, It is necessary to choose one of the men who's been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus was living among us. So Judas drops out of the twelve because he... Uh, Killed himself, and 
Peter says, we have to replace Judas. And the requirements are this. Someone who's been living with them, someone who's actually seen what Jesus did, said and did. One of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So they nominated two men. And then they cast lots. And the lot fell to Matthias, and so he was added to the eleven apostles. So when I, when I apply my, I put on my biblical studies hat, I put on my exegetical hat, why? <coughs> I mean, if you go to court and eleven people said you did it, the twelfth guy is just piling on. You don't even need the twelfth guy. Why twelve? Well, uh, let's think about that. When we think about what's happening in history, Luke's gospel doesn't record Judas' death. So he has to bring people up to speed historically. And so he says Judas Iscariot betrayed Jesus to the Jewish leaders. He led them to where there were no crowds around him so they could arrest him quietly. And Luke reminds the reader of Judas' end in the first chapter of Acts. Now Luke says that Judas bought a field, fell headlong, and his body burst open, and his intestines spilled out. Matthew's Gospel has a slightly different account where Judas goes out and hangs himself. So when we think about what's happening historically, okay, uh, there are two different accounts. Judas hanged himself. Judas fell headlong and his intestines burst out. It's possible to harmonize these two things and say perhaps Judas hanged himself and the rope broke possibly the day that he hanged himself or days later. And he burst open, whether he burst open by falling you know, on a rock or something, or whether he was ripped open by the activity of scavengers, this guy suffered a horrible death. And the field that it was purchased, it's possible that it was purchased in his name by the Jewish leaders who were so concerned about the money. Well, we can't put the money back in the temple treasury. It's blood money. So they bought a field in order to bury people who were unclean. And Judas was the first uh, burial there. <clears throat> so historically, what's going on? Judas died a horrible death. What's going on from a literary perspective? Because authors select and arrange and present things a certain way. From a literary perspective, Judas died the kind of death that was appropriate for a traitor. How would you describe a traitor's death in the most graphic and horrible way possible? It was painful and disgraceful. You see, the Jewish people were very concerned to handle bodies correctly. And Judas's wasn't because he was a traitor. Judas traded his position, and think about this, Judas traded his position as a follower of Jesus for property where the other disciples traded their property for a position with Jesus. With Judas' death, there are only 11 apostles, and so Peter kicks off the business meeting by noticing that he needs to be replaced. And then they identify the requirements. They bring out two people, they cast lots, and it falls to Matthias. Now, the, the interesting thing about Matthias is we don't, he doesn't ever appear ever again in Scripture. I mean, maybe some lists of people who were here or there, but he's not really a significant character. So what's going on here? Why do we have to get to 12? Having 12 apostles is important because it represents continuity with the 12 tribes of Israel. The way in which Christianity replaces Judaism is debated. But the point of Christian continuity with the God of Judaism is not controversial. Who is the God that you worship? The same God that was worshipped in ancient Israel, right? The God hasn't changed. It's not something new. The way in which we worship him. Well, now we have Jesus. Before Jesus was born, they looked forward to him. After Jesus has died and been resurrected, we look back. So this business meeting has a theological point. Craig Keener says this in his Acts commentary. Many scholars recognize that an important issue in this section is the choosing of the twelfth apostle because of the emphasis on Israel's restoration. That Jesus originally chose twelve as the nucleus of a reconstituted or remnant community is widely accepted. 
the restoration of the Twelve here thus fulfills a theological purpose for Luke's audience and for the earliest apostolic community. Well, what does that mean? It's continuity. You see, the church still hasn't formally started. There isn't a Christian church on one side of the street and a Jewish church on the other. That hasn't even been created yet. And so what Luke is trying to do is he's establishing continuity between the ancient faith of the Jews and Christianity. The word Christianity hasn't even been coined yet. These people were just followers of Jesus. Man, they're not very organized. They have to pick out a name for their church. That's probably the next business meeting, right? All right, we've got to pick out a name. What do you guys think of Pathways? Pathways. Pathways. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Only one way, right? Pathway. Only one way. <laughs> why is this business reading be, uh, why is this business meeting recorded in Scripture? To demonstrate continuity. There's one continuous apostolic witness from the, the twelve to the new twelve. There's one continuous God from the Old Testament to the New Testament. What's new and what's different is Jesus. Well, continuity and discontinuity are uh, ideas that have come up before in the Bible. When you think about and think back, <clears throat> there are sometimes things that are continuous, sometimes things that are discontinuous. Go back to Abraham. God made promises to Abraham. He says, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make you a great nation. And through you, all peoples of the earth will be blessed. This is Genesis 12, right? So Abraham has a certain set of commandments from God. To be obedient, to trust him. That's the thing that continues. But what is specific to Abraham is different from what is specific to, say, Moses, right? What did God tell Moses? Climb this mountain, receive these, uh, these laws, follow these laws. Set up the tabernacle. Abraham didn't have a tabernacle. Abraham got circumcision. Too bad, Abraham. But that continues on, right? As a sign of the covenant with God. So there's all these things that continue from one era to the next. So even though something changes, the important things stay the same. From Abraham to Moses, people are still required to trust God. People are still required to be obedient to him. Those things never really change. In Abraham's time, the priesthood was based on the family. Okay, so go all the way back to Abraham, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. Those guys were family-oriented priesthoods. That transitions in the book of Numbers to Moses having a national priesthood, where one family comes forward to serve the nation as priests. So there's this change of era from the pre-Moses or pre-Mosaic era to the Moses era. Does God change? No. His relationship with people changes from time to time. What's happening in Acts is a transition from the Old Covenant to the New, from the Old Testament to the New Testament, from Judaism to Christianity. But God doesn't change. And what he requires of us is still obedience. So there's continuity, but there's also discontinuity. One of the things that is always continuous in Scripture is how God requires us to come to him for salvation. It always requires a substitute. A broken relationship with God has always required a substitute. When Adam and Eve disobeyed God and recognized their nakedness, he clothed them with skins, demonstrating that a blood sacrifice was necessary to be restored to God. It's the idea of substitution. And when it comes to substitution, it's either you or a substitute. Okay, now what is the penalty for sin? Death. Yeah. death. So if the penalty for sin is death, and it's you or a substitute, what are you going to do? Substitute. Every time. What if that substitute is a fluffy lamb? <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> lamb. Because if it's you, and, and folks, I'm... It's kind of uncomfortable in the modern world to think about blood sacrifice as a payment for the forgiveness of sins. I didn't write it. God wrote it. And if the idea is substitution and it's you or a substitute, the substitute gets it every time. 
So Abraham, so Adam and Eve, they needed a substitute to restore their relationship to God. What about Abraham? Well, Abraham, uh, in the text of Scripture, he called on the name of the Lord, which is a way to describe worship, and he built altars. So Abraham was familiar with the ideas of sacrifice. What about Moses? Moses built a tabernacle. One of the features of the tabernacle is an altar where the priests offer animal sacrifices. So every era has been characterized by substitution for a restoration of relationship with God. Yours too. Who's your substitute? Jesus. That's right. Did he shed his blood for you? Yes. Yes, he did. And it's humbling to think that the Son of God would come down and be your substitute. And so we, uh, where we might be like, oh yeah, so sorry, Mr. Sheep. Then we say, man, the Son of God died on the cross for me. And that's humbling. So there's continuity. There's always continuity in who God is. There's continuity in the salvation relationship where it always requires a substitute. In the past, animals were provided as substitutes. In the present, Jesus is the substitute. And every change isn't because people decided, you know, I'm tired of sacrificing sheep. Let's kill the Son of God. No, that's not, people didn't decide this. This is God's plan all along. And God's plan wasn't interrupted by the treachery of Judas. Right? Right. It was always God's plan for Jesus to die on the cross as our substitute. And every new era required the people of God to carefully discern the right way to worship Him. The book of Acts records the origin of Christianity as continuous with the worship of God and discontinuous with the practices of Judaism. The sacrificial system, the formal priesthood are all summed up and finalized in the person and work of Jesus. And so Acts is an apologetic history. It's defending the Christian faith. It's the continuation of Judaism. It's the right way to worship God. Now I recognize, and if you're, if you're familiar with dispensationalism, there's plenty of discontinuity as well. We are not Israel. But we are worshiping the same God that Israel worshiped. The appointment of Matthias demonstrates continuity within the apostolic circle and in larger continuity of the Christian mission with the ancient faith of Judaism. Now, normally, uh, I would start with a creative illustration to capture your attention and lead you into the sermon. I didn't do that, because I think the text is fun. The business <laughs> meeting. So I'll end with this idea about continuity. Do you know where we notice continuity the most? When there's an error in continuity. When there's a moment where you look at a movie and you're like, hey, what just happened? Or who's that guy in the background wearing modern clothes in an ancient movie, right? <clears throat> Perhaps, and I don't want to ruin anybody's movie-going experience, movies aren't real. <laughs> and one of my favorite movies, Shrek, has a number of continuity errors. There aren't any kids in here, are there? <laughs> in the movie Shrek, the door sometimes opens inward to his house and sometimes opens outward. And it can't be both because sometimes he slams the door. That's an error. And so the director had to look at this and say, okay, is this continuity error okay? Here's another example. In the movie Gladiator, another favorite of mine, the chariot tips over, and if you're watching carefully, you can see a gas tank on the back of the chariot. <laughs> the horse-drawn chariot. Right? You see, we notice when continuity doesn't work, when there's an error in continuity. Folks, there is no error in the continuous witness of the life and of Jesus Christ. There's no continuity error there. The same God provided his son as a substitute for you and I. There can't be continuity errors in God's story. So when someone looks at you and says, and, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close with something that's, that actually happened last night. I, I sat down with my notes and I said, when somebody, I, I was sort of, I had an idea, 
And so I stopped watching TV to go write it down. When someone tells you this or that, you remember that there's a continuous witness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so I wrote that down in my notes. And I got a phone call from a friend of mine. A friend of mine who's an atheist, whom I love. I love this kid. And he, he, had, he wanted to talk about economics and socialized medicine and all those kind of things. And I'm happy to talk. I'm not for any of that. But I'm happy to talk to him and just be a dialogue partner with him. And, you know, when does capitalism work well? When, when does any economic system work well? When it's full of people who love each other. What, who, who loves one another? Well, Christians do. They're supposed to be. And so in this idea of Christianity, which is characterized by valuing the other person because God says to value that person, and valuing this person because God says to value this person. So when this person, on the rare occasion when she makes a mistake, I still value her because she's created in God's image. That applies to all of you as well. When you do something that you're not supposed to do, I value you and love you, not because of who you are, but because God created you in his image. And so it provides an objective foundation for every relationship that you have with anybody. And it's founded on, or, or as I discussed this with my friend, uh, he, he said, well, Christianity is just, you know, it's a pipe dream. <laughs> and so our discussion got a little animated. <laughs> and I said, you have to understand this one thing, this one idea. This is the rock on which Christianity stands or falls. It's the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It happened in history. And so he wanted to sort of talk around that, go this way and that way, and I love this guy, but I kept bringing him back to, you have to answer this question. Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, and these guys are the authoritative apostolic witnesses to it. They saw it happen, and they died for it. Amen. So riddle me this. Why? Would you die for a lie? Would you die, be tortured, be dragged behind horses? Would you do any of that shot through with spears thrown into boiling oil? Would you do that for a lie? I wouldn't. If you were going to start some crazy new religion, would you go to downtown of some other religion? Would you go to... I'm going to talk about the Catholics now. I'm talking to the camera, not to anybody. <laughs> Would you go to Vatican City and try to start some new religion that was different, that was discontinuous? I'm pretty sure they'd run you out of town. That's what the book of Acts is going to record. As soon as the Jews start realizing that Christianity is discontinuous with Judaism, they're going to hunt those people down. And they're not going to waver. Some of them will, but they're not going to waver, by and large, because of the apostolic witness to who Jesus is, he raised from the dead, that's a fact of history, what are you going to do about it? And so I'm having this very pointed conversation with this friend whom I love, and I keep coming back around to this point, and I'll bring it to you as well. Jesus Christ raised from the dead, what are you and I going to do about it? It changes everything about who we are. It's a fact of history. So when you're talking to someone out there in the world and they say, well, they just made it up, you say, really? They died for something that they made up? That's ridiculous. That couldn't have happened. It's much more likely that it really happened. And you have to answer why. Well, I think I'm going to stab you now. Whether you stab me or don't stab me, you still haven't answered the question about the resurrection. If it's a fact of history, it changes everything about the world we live in. And it is, by the way, an established fact of history. Amen. These 12 guys are the video evidence. They're the authoritative witnesses that it happened. There's no continuity errors with what God's done. As the praise team comes up, you know, you can enjoy Shrek. <laughs> you can enjoy Gladiator. You can enjoy all those movies. But you can trust the apostolic witness to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Amen. Father, I thank you so much for all that you've given in your word. I thank you so much, Lord, that you've given us a continuous witness to who you are. I pray, Father, as we continue to witness your goodness, your grace, your love, Lord, it's not something fluffy, it's something real. It's not about a feeling, Lord, it's about a fact. And I pray, Lord, that you give us the boldness to proclaim these facts 
to a world that often isn't listening. To do it with love, to do it with kindness, to do it with friendliness and warmth, Lord, but to never back down from the fact that it's true. And Father, I pray for my friends here today, as we go about your business, Lord, that you would be glorified, that your word would be proclaimed here in Jackson County. We thank you in Christ's name.
Father God, thank you so much for all that you do. Lord, thank you for your son, Jesus. Jesus, thank you for the call. The call you placed on this one.